Welcome to the Recover Yourself Podcast. I'm your host, Martin John, the Recovery Mentor. In this podcast, we address all the things that you're going to face on a journey towards recovering yourself, which is ultimately what we're all here to do, not just those of us that are addicts. This podcast is all about expanding the definition and scope of the words addict and recovery. So everyone has an opportunity to engage in this, not just those of us that are traditionally understood as being addicts. This is going to be a bit of a different episode because I am here to talk to you about the last six episodes. Previously, I just interviewed people about their experience of recovering themselves. There were many episodes where I talked to great people about great ideas uh, that they had experienced and we asked everybody very similar questions and, and, and it was a wonderful source of recovery information. What I'm interested in though is getting the message of what recovering yourself really looks like on the ground. And all of those hinted at it because everybody has their own experience. But I decided to change the format so I can talk about the topics that we're going to deal with as individuals in long-term recovery, even in short-term recovery that want to eventually get to long-term recovery. And so these past six episodes were great in like really encapsulating some of the things that we're going to deal with and some of the things that we have to keep in mind as we're moving through our own creativity. So there are expectations of others, myths of intoxication, there is evolution and why the myths need to be able to go away. Um, and then we talk about patience and calmness uh, and being able to step into your recovery, especially in early recovery. And then beyond that, we talk about treatment centers, one which was from a counselor's perspective who had since left the treatment center world to start her own practice and one, an executive director of a treatment center, one uh, in which I think is doing some very special work. So I'm going to recap these episodes for you so that we can point out some of the most important takeaways from all of these episodes. And then at the end, I'm going to help you connect the dots between the two and why it's so important that these episodes were put together in the way they were. So I might be taking a little of the magic out for you because, uh, of course, uh, in, 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 in all of my work, as, as you may know, I'm a creative and I'm, I'm real happy about my creative choices. And so the choices that I make in order to talk about what topics is all part of the landscape of this. And what I want to do is just plant seeds for you. And I want you to be able to tend to that garden and grow into who you are because there is no right answer. There is no one answer to how you are going to create and recover yourself. So in my first episode that I'm going to be covering is with Lona Curry, a trans man who is in recovery. And we are talking about invisible laws of normal and other people's expectations. So although Lona is a trans man, we talked so much more about transition and recovery than we did talk about gender identity. I really love speaking with people that have gone through and are going through gender transition, however they define that because they can't hide from their transitioning. In recovery, we have this experience where, and, and I see it online all the time, how do I tell people that I'm not drinking? Well, just asking that question means that you're trying to hide the fact that you're not drinking, that you've had a problem with your, uh, your alcohol or your drug use or whatever it is that you're doing. And the thing is, is that when you're in gender transition, you can't hide from that transition. And I always want to encourage people not to hide their transitions. You are going into this as you, and you're going to be coming out of it as you as well. And so hiding from those transitions that you're making, hiding from those changes you're making in your life is not going to help you make those changes in any way. So when we talk about those invisible laws of normals, we're talking about what we were taught to be normal. When we're born, we're individuals. And yet before we're born, we're already starting to conform to some sort of a normal. And that normal is in no way ever who we are, because that's some box. And that box cannot fit all that we are. So the point of that episode is to look at if we were driven to use drink or whatever to escape because 
we weren't comfortable with who we were, but we weren't comfortable with who we were because we were expected to be who we weren't, then recovering from our addiction has to be our first step. I talk a lot about recovering too, and this is a wonderful sort of ultimate place that you want to get to, but we have to recover from this symptom that we've picked up to deal with trying to not fit in. Once we've recovered from, we'd be able to move forward into recovering too. But that is a big takeaway from this episode. And I want to make sure everybody understands that we have to get over escaping, but we escaped a thing. We escaped not being able to be who we were. And recovering too is about becoming who we are. And so in order to get there, we have to stop escaping. And we may be escaping in a number of ways. Some people may escape with exercise. Some people may escape with parenting. Some people may escape with their emotional loops. Some people may escape with drugs, alcohol, shopping, gaming, you name it. You may even escape in little ways with coffee. You may escape in little ways with smoking. All of those things could be used as means of escape, which is why I want to have this conversation about expanding what recovery and addiction look like. So I want to add that everything that uh, that I talk about, there are two sides, right? There's your side and there's not your side. And being yourself can be very threatening to those who cannot find it within themselves to do that. And that was you at some point. And that not feeling comfortable with others being themselves, that fear, that, that feeling, that all of that internal judgment that we have for those people who are trying to stand out and be different and we judge them because we want to be part of the majority, that's the root of our stigma. The stigma that we carry with us, that we're saying, oh, they're judging me. They're judging me and, and, and I know they're judging me. And then I can get mad at them because I'm, I can use this stigma and I can say, you're giving me stigma. When actually I gave stigma to myself a long time ago. And, that, and that's because I keep hiding or I had kept hiding from who I was. This is why it's so important for me to talk to people like Lona who can't hide from what's going on in his life. So it doesn't come from other people, which is why it's not interesting for me to try and eradicate stigma. Stigma is something that we carry and we need to be able to face in order to be able to accept and be who we're going to be next. This conversation led Lona and I uh, to talk about minority stress, which, you know, basically means like if you're a minority in a situation, you're going to experience stress. Now, Lona brings up a great point and says when a minority enters your surroundings, wherever you are, even if they're you know, out in public, they could be the majority, but here in this situation, they're minimo- they're mi- they are the minority. What does that feel like for you? You know, and if you're, and if you are part of the majority, like myself, I'm a white male, right? Um, if, if someone comes into my experience, how do, how do I feel about that? What do I, what do I do with that information? Am I trying to change them? Am I threatened by that? And is that because I just don't want to be the minority? Is that just because I don't want to experience being the minority? And so I want to defend my majority status. This often happens when we walk into a bar. I want to defend my majority status of being an alcoholic. And you tell me you don't drink. Well, all of a sudden, you're the minority. I know you're the minority because I'm in a bar. I'm the majority. I stand by my right to not listen to myself, not be in touch with my own health, and I can attack you in verbal ways, in all sorts of ways. That may be what I do. That's not stigma, right? Like stigma is how you receive it. What that is to me is defensive, like me as an alcoholic in a bar trying to defend my position because you're standing in your position. You're standing proudly in the position of someone who doesn't drink, and that offends me because I couldn't do that. And as someone in the majority, as someone who is drinking, I, I'm not drinking, of course, but like I'm just trying to tell a story here. <laughs> um, as somebody that you know drinks, like I'm trying to stand up for myself, and I get it, and you have the right you don't have anything to stand up for, but you have the right to drink and I'm not trying to stop you from drinking. And, and we as uh, sober people need to be able to stand up for that and not ask people, how do I tell people I don't drink? 
because however you fucking want to tell people you don't drink. Like, I don't drink is a fine, full, complete sentence, right? Like, there's nothing, you, there's nothing trivial about it. So much of this episode is about hiding and being within yourself. Because if you can be within yourself, you don't have to hide. And if you don't have to hide, then you're constantly open to, of course, you're open to judgment, you're open to criticism, and you're opening yourself up to all of these things. But those are the things that you had given yourself, which is why you needed to escape. And so we all need to look at why did we judge ourselves for being us? And how can I move forward without judging myself? How can I move forward with being myself? And this leads us into the next episode because the next episode is about creativity and intoxication. Now, if there's anything I know about, it's creativity and intoxication. Being a creative, I was talking to Pop Buchanan. He's a hip hop artist and a, and a creative. And, he's, and he and I have a great conversation about intoxication and creativity. Now, Pop is also the host of the Sober's Dope podcast. If you don't, if you don't know that podcast, definitely check it out. Pop's doing some really great work. I'm going to be on the show at some point soon, and I'm looking forward to that. The fact that there is a myth of intoxication and creativity means that there are expectations about these two things being connected. There are expectations other people have of us to be intoxicated and be creative. And there are a lot of reasons for this, right? Like creatives and addicts have some similar traits, right? So creatives and addicts are both novelty seeking. So they're constantly looking for new things to excite them, new things to um, be exciting to them. And if we think about the last episode, if we think about the episode with Lona Curry, what we're seeing is that people are trying to escape. People are trying to escape their lives. And so, of course, they're looking for novelty. They're looking for ways to fit in. They're looking for ways that their lives make sense. You know, novelty seeking sounds, sounds like, oh, you're just looking to have fun. But we, we have to take it a step further. Novelty seeking is actually just looking for different things like looking for novelty is how it looks like from the outside so that's how it's going to be expressed but what it really is is looking for meaning i'm looking for something to care about i'm looking for something to do that fills my life with purpose or that fills my life with fulfillment and so that could very easily be seen and is seen and identified as novelty seeking now those of us who are addicts um, looked for novelty through addiction. And maybe it doesn't seem like that is us looking for purpose. But when life doesn't seem to have purpose because we can't be who we are, that is what it is, right? We don't understand how we fit in. And we don't fit in because we are not in line with the small amount of things that our world has to offer. We have more ways of going to school today, right? But there is one major traditional way of going to school, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic kind of thing. And if you don't fit into that, well, tough. Most of the creatives, most of the dancers, most of the, the, the artists, most of the singers, most of the people that need something else other than reading, writing, and arithmetic are going to fall through the cracks. And many of those in novelty seeking and seeking a way to fit in will tend toward addiction. Now, this episode, uh, Intoxication and Creativity, is uh is all about creativity and intoxication we we do talk a little bit about trauma and i talk a lot about trauma in the previous episode uh with lona curry as well but if we have trauma that's also us not fitting in right we our our trauma could lead us to feel like we don't fit in and so we go out and we look for drugs and we look for different ways to express ourselves because we don't feel like we can fit into the world as it is uh, extremes in terms of searching for, for different ways of fitting in could give us an insensitivity towards punishment. Trying so many different things may get us in trouble. Trying many different things to get attention may find 
us doing things that are outside the moral ideas of other people. So when we gain an insensitivity towards punishment, we can further step into our addiction because we don't care about the punishment, whether it's to our bodies or to our lives, if we're put in prison or um, killed even. And if we happen to start getting attention um, or acceptance through our novelty seeking, our insensitivity towards punishment, then we are living lives of very practiced disinhibition. We have lowered inhibitions about everything. We try so many different things. We just don't fit in. All of these things are really important things to note when you're listening to this episode, because what we've done is we've connected creativity and intoxication. Addiction and creativity have some of the same exact traits. All of these traits could be a attested to both of these groups of people. And so the myth and the expectation people have, if you're a creative, is that you're also going to be an addict. Now, the other way doesn't always work. If you're an addict, you're not necessarily creative, but it is important to take into consideration that in our society, these two things are very linked, which means we all have expectations. And if you grow up in the society and you don't fit in and you start using and you start making stuff, you very well could fall into a creative life that's full of addiction because of the expectations that have been put on you by a society that's pretty small thinking. We can see, I think, how those two things have come together. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to the Pop Buchanan episode about creativity and intoxication, I encourage you to. It's a wonderful episode. We talk a lot about something that we call above the line and below the line creativity. Um, and this is going to lead us into our next episode, which would be uh, the episode following that, which was evolution, because 50 years ago, there were things that were awesome and they are no longer awesome today. The reason a lot of that stuff was able to be created was because of intoxication. Today, however, the line between us and consciousness and that creative consciousness that we're all attached to is very, very thin, super thin we can get what we call above the line creative, which means we can energize ourselves. We can get there without the use of substance. And below the line, and, and Pop talks about it in a wonderful way where he says, when you are creating below the line, when you're, doing, when you're in, engaging in below the line creativity, what you're actually doing is you're asking your drug of choice, can you be creative today? you are not creating from your own space. And so I want you to look at that when you listen to that episode. I want you to, to really kind of take that in and understand that the myth that we have as a society, that creativity and intoxication are connected, is connected to expectations of others, which was what we addressed in the previous episode with Lona Curry. As I just spoke about, evolution was a big part of the episode with Pop Buchanan. And it is no mistake that many more people are going to be joining us on the sober journey because this veil between us and all that is, is thinner. And that led me to wanting to talk to Alan Baker. And Alan's episode is cosmic. Um, I have no other way of expressing it. I believe uh, Dana Wheelis um, of the uh, Ask a Wayfinder podcast expressed it that way. Uh, she commented to me about that episode. Um, Alan and I speak about evolution. And we talk about how it's the little things. And not only is it the little things, it's the awareness of the little things. And he talks about paying attention. And I recall asking him, like, what does it mean to pay attention? And he took a minute and he said, well, it's just being open to receiving it. It's like you can't you can't take love, but you can receive love. And so paying attention to how you're receiving. It. And if everyone can just stop and think about like when you're upset, when you have your blinders on, when you're triggered, what are you receiving? And if you think about it, you're not receiving anything. Everything is coming out of you. You're not open to receiving. It's like you're pushing things away. And it was a really great episode for a number of reasons. And 
Evolution has been a topic I've wanted to talk about for a long time, but I wanted to make sure it was the right time to talk about it because it's, it's, a, it's a very deep conversation and it's one that I want people to really glom onto because we, we have so much information today and it's all coming from the past. And if we've evolved, how, how accurate is that information? And I'm not saying we should throw it out, but I do want to always be questioning it questioning the validity of the information that we that we're getting from 30 years ago 50 years ago 80 years ago is an important step in our lives in my life i know i like to question the validity of my choices today if i made them yesterday because i may be a different person today and so that's an important aspect to how we're being able to recover ourselves. So evolution, as it fits in with recovering yourself, is finally reaching or growing beyond the tipping point. So Alan and I address the wide scope of evolution. We talk about labels a lot, um, and who you believe yourself to be, right? Like, I am a mother, I am a father, I am a sister, I am a brother, and how you find the phrase and how you finish the phrase, I am. Because no matter how you finish that phrase, you're locking yourself into something smaller. Even if you, even if you have 30 different I am statements, they are not all that you are. Because so much of what you are can't be defined. Um, so a huge point I wanted to make sure everyone walked away with from that interview with Alan is that today we are not the same as we were yesterday. And things, things are picking up pace so rapidly that you could literally wake up tomorrow and be a person who does something very different than you're doing today. And if that's the case, we have to look back to all of that writing and all of that stuff that we're referencing that was written even last year. Those things are extremely out of date and they're not coming from you. So although some things can plant seeds in your head, regurgitating them is not the right route you want to go. You have evolved. We are evolving beyond that. We're evolved, we are evolving beyond this type A personality running the show. We, as individuals, each of us, have our answer. And if we keep reverting to looking at those type A personalities, those are the people that the world accepts anyway. They fit. Those of us who don't fit, those of us who don't who, who were driven to alcohol and drugs because we weren't type A personalities, because we didn't fit in outside of that. We're the ones that have to figure out what evolution has in store for us. And if you're making the same choices you were making yesterday without re-examining those choices or habits, then you may be keeping yourself from evolving. We all have free will, so we can easily talk ourselves into being someone who drinks alcohol every day, or, and this might hit home a bit more, someone who drinks coffee every day. We can label ourselves and identify ourselves as someone who loves coffee. And if you listen to an earlier interview I did with Trenda Hedges, you, you may be able to read between the lines and see that ritual and whatever other excuse we want to give to our coffee addiction doesn't excuse the fact that we may be avoiding being aware of something by allowing ourselves that comfort. Evolution is growing our connection to consciousness. And it happens through active participation. Looking back to that first uh, episode with Lona Curry, we addressed actively being aware of our feelings when someone in the position of a minority enters our space. Well, we have to do the same thing when we choose to stay comfortable with our daily actions. What's the minority? And where are we choosing to be a majority? Right? Are we choosing to be a majority by having our coffee every morning? Are we choosing to be a majority by driving to work every day? Are we choosing to be a majority by, um, by having a home, by having a family, by being part of the things that our society is expecting from us? Questioning those things is important. It's scary because you've probably defined your entire life around those things. But questioning them and just questioning them is a big step because if you're afraid to question them, that means that they might not be being addressed at all, which means if they go off the rails, how would you know? Being put in situations that are uncomfortable is part of our growing and learning. And once we learn how to do that with drugs and alcohol, 
or whatever else we had to step away from is is a great start at at that point though it's not done i mean we're not going to just nurse that poor pitiful me attitude that we used to be we're not just going to be like oh i was an addict i was an addict i was an addict look at me now i am an ex addict right like that's not that's not the end of our growth evolution has grown us as a species beyond that and we have the opportunity to lead the way and not be confined to any box under any label to whatever extreme you can imagine that to be in my episode with alan he mentioned gender and that we should choose whatever gender makes us most comfortable but he said if it were up to him he wouldn't identify with any of it why because identifying it means that you might be making choices that you don't want to make because those are the expectations others have for you and that which you identify this is uncomfortable territory which leads us directly into our next episode with uh, dina barnes where we spoke about patience in the process of recovery the process of healing um, through recovery often mimics, and she and I agree on this completely, uh, the, the healing of a cut on your skin. Like you can't do anything to heal your cuts, right? You can't do anything physically other than keep it clean and give it some awareness. And those are the things that we talk about doing in that episode um, about patients uh, within our recovery process. Because in order to get to a place where we can step into our evolution, we have to recover from. We have to recover from that which we were escaping with. Because once we can get to a space where it's like, okay, I'm no longer escaping who I am, well, that's painful. And there are a lot of cuts that we gave our soul while we were on that process. Well, now it's the time to let that scab up and it's gonna hurt. And sometimes we'll brush up against things and that scab will peel off and it'll bleed again. But we have to allow it to heal and we have to allow it to heal well, meaning we don't want to continue to infect it. So another wonderful episode uh, with, with Dina. And then we moved into treatment centers because we were, you know, we had all these high, high, uh, high thoughts about, uh, about recovering too. And all of these, and all of these wonderful conversations with people talking about deep, deep things. And then we're going to get into some nuts and bolts. April Garfoli, a wonderful woman who is doing great stuff within the world of recovery. She and I have a lot of similarities in terms of how we look at the world and how we see it. And April Garfoli was a counselor in a number of treatment centers uh, in, in her career and has recently stepped away from that to pursue her own work. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is a very factual, a very concrete episode about what treatment centers look like. And then this is an important aspect because after talking about feeling uncomfortable with Dina, I wanted you to understand that like people don't necessarily always have your best interest at heart. Now treatment centers are great and treatment centers are a place to learn as, uh, as April said, they're a great place to learn about where you can fill up your tank when your life is on E, right? Treatment centers are a wonderful place to do that. And everybody in a treatment center really wants you to do well. But we also have to think about the insurance companies and we have to think about what their benefits are. Everybody needs to get paid and the help that you receive isn't always equal everybody could be called a counselor. And if you listen to that episode, we break down a lot of things that you're gonna to need to know if you're gonna be going into a treatment center. It's important to ask your provider what their qualifications are. And it's important for you to understand what those qualifications are and what you're looking for. It is important for you to take ownership and, and um, advocate for yourself if you're finding yourself in a treatment center. And this episode will give you a little bit of insight as to some things that you might want to know. Where are they getting funded? What kind of insurance are they dealing with? What is their insurance looking for? Because it's very important for you if you want to be in that treatment center and if you have to get through that treatment center to benefit from it. Like we don't want you there if you don't want to benefit from it. 
But recovering from and recovering to are things that you're going to have to be able to embrace if you want to. So if you're interested in what's going on in the treatment center, that's a wonderful episode to check out because April's got a lot to offer. And it, it is about traditional treatment centers. And she has been in many. And so she's seen a lot of different things. Last week's episode, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, was Dan Hostetler. Dan is amazing. Dan is on the board of Smart Recovery USA. And he is part of the process of Above and Beyond uh, treatment facility here in Chicago. And Above and Beyond takes an approach of uh, finding your life's purpose. And it comes from Logotherapy, which was started by um, Victor Frankel. His insight into what happens with his facility and how he has managed his facility to be one of the, in my opinion, one of the best uh, facilities in Chicago. Uh, he even expresses that the people that go through his system, even though he should be seeing over 200 expressions of suicidal ideation in his facility, he is seeing zero or completely negligible experiences of that or expressions of that. So the people that I talk to, Mona Curry, Pop Buchanan, Alan Baker, Dina Barnes, April Garfoli, and Dan Hostetler have a lot to offer and all of these are connected. You see, even evolutionarily, when we talk about episode, the third episode this, in, this, in this grouping, which is Alan's, we talk about evolution and then we talk about Dan Hosteller. It would be impossible to have Dan's if we weren't in a space that was, if we weren't in a mental conscious state in which that veil had been thinned. He wouldn't be able to succeed as he has. All of the other institutions are having 200 expressions. All of the other same size, typical, you know, same size, same hours, same sort of setup that Dan has it above and beyond. All the other ones are experiencing 200 suicidal ideations a month. Dan's experiencing none. Right? This is because traditional spaces were built from spaces in the past. And Dan is trying to build something new at Above and Beyond. And I'm super proud to be connected with him. And I'm super proud to be connected with Alan because talking about this evolution stuff is great. If we can all understand that we have access to that, we have access to that strength, people are finding today that they have access to strength they never had access to before. And so, yes, we're evolving. And yes, there are myths around intoxication and being interesting and being attractive and being creative. But those are expectations that other people have on us. And we need to let those go. And those expectations need to be let go across the board, which is what Lona and I talked about. And letting go of those is going to be uncomfortable. That's what Dina and I talked about. Letting go of those might also put me in a position of having to go to a treatment center, traditional treatment center that isn't open and isn't and then that is addressing me when I walk in and not trusting me from the moment I walk in. Well, if you don't trust me when I walk in, my guess is there's someone in that institution that doesn't trust, and I'm already feeling the hostility. So we ended with Dan, and I think it's a great way to end because this is the direction of treatment centers, the direction of the treatment that we're going to be giving people that are coming out of addiction. And I'm hoping that the word addiction can really expand so that people have access to this logotherapy work and to purpose and to life in this bigger sense than ever. So that was a, a recap of what we looked at over the last number of episodes. And I'm glad that you all came with me. Of course, there are more and more people joining the Recover Yourself uh podcast and following the recover yourself podcast than ever and i'm super excited about that these past episodes have seen a, a great increase in numbers of of listens and so please keep passing it on keep letting people know and i'm going to put links to all of the episodes in the description of this uh, episode so you can check those out individually if you are interested if you haven't listened to the previous episodes 
episodes where I interview Ruby Warrington, author of Silver Curious, and uh, Laura McCowan, author of We Are the Luckiest. These interviews are great, and we really open up some of these people that maybe you have heard interviews with before. Well, I have heard people say that in my episodes, I'm being, I'm able to get more out of them than they have experienced in other episodes. My interview process is pretty dope. I do a great job. I love what I do. I keep doing it and I'm doing it because I love it. And I hope you love it. And if you do, please rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. And any comments that you make, I want to be able to check out uh, so that I can make this podcast better. You can support this show at anchor.fm or support me and all of my work on Patreon. Doing that, you can get access to unedited content and one-on-one access to me as well as group portrait sessions. I always recover your self workshops regularly for groups, uh, individuals that are within the field can earn CEUs. Otherwise, it is also open to the public and those pricings are slightly different. Um, I also do a limited number of one-on-one work to help people recover themselves. I want to thank you again for listening to the Recover Yourself podcast. I'm your host, Martin John, and until next time, keep recovering yourself.